lately I've been having some trouble, uh, mentally that is. It really just feels like I'm almost a shell. Colors started just feeling gray to me. Passion started numbing. Uh, I became way too obsessed with numbers. For example, is this video going to get enough views? I'm not making enough money that I would like to make. Why is this person getting so many more of these numbers than I am getting? This thing that I felt was a creative outlet, a passion of mine started turning into more of a business rather than a passion. I stopped creating and started just going through the motions, doing it because I have to do it, not because it's something I want to do. I mean, the one thing I'm extremely thankful for is the fact that, you know, I don't have to deal with this stuff alone. My wife and my son are pretty much the only source of happiness I've had in a long time. It almost feels like I'm a passenger to myself in my own life. And then I watched and read The Little Prince. Now, the timing of this is quite perfect, I would say. Everything in this book is honestly something that I really needed to hear. It's kind of a perspective shift more than anything else. Because a lot of this stuff I've definitely heard plenty of times before, but it's the perspective that it's set in that made it different. Now, for those people who just look at this book for the first time, instantly you're gonna think, this is a children's book. And I'm here to tell you that it would be a huge insult to consider this book just a children's book. Anyone out there right now, I highly, highly recommend that you get this book. It's 83 pages. There's even pictures in it, okay? And you know, it's not just words. Now, in this video, we're going to be focusing more on the movie element of this book, but I am also going to be covering portions of this book because it's really good. Little Prince is a story that is narrated by an aviator that crashes in the middle of the desert and meets a little prince. And this little prince came to earth from a different planet. And this prince speaks about his journey and his life, relationships, work, creativity, life, death, adulthood. There's so much to cover in this book. I feel like the best way to describe this book is kind of adulthood from the perspective of a child. Because adulthood honestly seems foolish at many times to a child. I mean, in life, sometimes you really need that naivety of a child to truly grasp how simple things truly are that you make difficult. You know, adults really only care about numbers, you know, how old you are, how much money you make, how many people do I command. Things that in a sense have absolutely zero intrinsic value. Anything that is essential is invisible to the eye. There are a lot of lessons that come with this movie. Literally on the first page, we talk about creativity. The idea that when you become an adult, you forget how to be creative. You, you kind of lose your imagination. The aviator talks about how when he was younger, he drew a picture of a snake that ate an elephant. But every adult ended up just seeing a picture of a hat. And so the aviator decided to draw a picture with a detailed elephant on the inside of the snake and the adult's response is a classic hey you should probably stop doing art and do something smart like geography arithmetic grammar you know something important another one is about relationships and how it's not about what you see on the surface and it's about the little moments in your life a big part of this book and the movie focuses on the concept of a relationship as in a way taming someone for example a wild fox Obviously, that would just be a regular fox, you know, just that one out of a, a, a million other foxes. However, if you tame that fox, that is your fox, and that is the special one. It's creating that invisible bond. That's the thing that becomes essential, not necessarily the fox itself. Another decent lesson in this is about love and how love is quite difficult, and you can't just walk away when things get tough, which happens in this story. Creating bonds is not a simple task. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of time, a lot of difficult things. And death, death is a very big portion of this movie. And, and I would say probably the biggest lesson in this. And it's not necessarily a death itself. It's more of how you deal with death and, and a different way to look at death. Because in this movie, death was never really shown in the physical sense. It was more of shown symbolic. One of my favorite lines in this book and movie is it will be like an old abandoned shell. And there's nothing sad about an old abandoned shell. I mean, the idea that when someone dies, it's not necessarily something sad because that person, that bond will always stay with you forever. I remember watching this movie when it originally came out and I I don't remember enjoying it that much. But I feel like the reason I didn't 
It's because I wasn't really watching it properly. I wasn't paying attention enough. You know, I was just watching it on surface level, you know, just it looked like a basic Pixar movie. But let me tell you, it is way more deep than just a basic Pixar movie. But let's start focusing more on the movie because the movie kind of took the book and made a story around uh, the story of the book itself and kind of how it would relate to the real world today, which I feel like this book you would consider a timeless classic. It is one of like the best selling books of all time because it deals with the human condition condition and it will never go out of style because it always relates to something. It takes place in the perspective of a child being raised like a machine. You know, every time of every day is planned. There's like a specific regimen down to the minute, down to the second that this little girl has to do every single day in order to get to this perfect school. She is basically what you would consider an adult in a child's body, doing everything down to the minute, leaving no time for the creativity, for just being a child in general. And then we have the polar opposite, which that would be the aviator who lives next door to the little girl and is the narrator of the story. He is what you would consider a child in an old man's body. And throughout the movie, they become friends and kind of learn from each other because they are polar opposites and it works out. They kind of teach each other. And the ending of this movie is quite different uh, compared to the book because it kind of continues on the ending of where the book left off, leaving you with a little bit more of closure. Whereas in the book, it kind of left it on an open-ended note where you kind of just had to, you know, use your imagination in a way. And I just want to say, holy shit, this movie is beautiful animation and music wise. I mean, sure, a lot of the movie is the standard Pixar style animation, but the parts I'm talking about that are beautiful are the stop motion parts where you actually hear the aviator talk about the story. It literally looks like you are looking at a moving book because they actually actually used paper in order to stop motion all of these characters and it turned out so fucking cool and the soundtrack is amazing obviously because it's Hans Zimmer you know the man behind Pirates of the Caribbean Interstellar Dune and so many more the music is whimsical it's fun it perfectly aligns with the creative childlike wonderment there's so much good in the film so let's actually talk about the film finally okay I'm gonna do it I promise but before I do I have a question for you guys do you smell that Doritos, Red Bull, and sweat. Oh wait, that's you. You guys really need to up your smell game. So why not try Scentbird? This is one thing I use to freshen up when I play games because let's be real, I never leave the house. But seriously, Scentbird is reimagining how people find and experience fragrances. The perfect way to find your style, maybe start a collection, you know, not having to spend loads of money on the big packages. Instead of buying an entire bottle of fragrance, you could just choose a new designer every single month for a measly fee of $17. And every month you get to pick the fragrances that you want, no surprises whatsoever. And they come in this nice convenient little package, it's like a little magnetic thing, pop out, See what you got. It's actually really convenient, I'm not gonna lie. Like imagine having one of these, you just slide it into your pocket, maybe in your purse, or something like that. They have perfumes, they have colognes, it's all unisex. And with each fragrance, you get a 30 day supply. You know, I guess depending on if you spray a buttload a day. Don't be that guy. All right, use it sparingly. And all it takes to find out your preferences is a simple little quiz that you do on Scentbird. They recommend scents to you, you pick them and boom, bam. And I would say my favorite scent is right here, Parfums de Marly Paris Percival. I said that perfectly, just saying. With hints of mandarin, pink pepper, lavender, and germany, germany, nim. It smells good, that's all I know. And if you guys use my code in the description or listed right here, you can get 55% off your order. That's just above $7 for your first month of Scentbird. And this is only available in the US and Canada, by the way. So get your Scentbird today and thank you Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Stop stinking, smell like a Chad. So the movie begins with the opening page of the book like I talked about before. The aviator voiced by Jeff Bridges talks about when he was younger, he was interested in the idea of snakes swallowing things whole, and so he drew a picture of a snake swallowing something and like I said before, the whole hat thing happened. And this relates even today because constantly I see people getting their creativity shut down at such a young age, you know, their parents not allowing them to draw, not allowing them to do fun, uh, imaginative things. And would rather their child focus on very adult things at such a young age that just kills their creativity so young. And then we zoom in on a world where everything looks gray, 
organized and hustle and bustle busy. And the word essential is thrown constantly around because the movie kind of bases it off the quote from the Fox. Anything essential is invisible to the eye, whereas in the quote unquote real world, it's the complete opposite. Because from the get go, we get a shot of a line of posters that ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the little kid on the posters answer is essential. Showing what a lot of people would consider to be essential, but in reality, it's kind of meaningless. We see the mom and the little girl practicing their lines over and over to prepare for an interview to get into this prestigious school. And they really nailed that pure anxiety of standing up on stage and having all these adults judge this child. And she ends up failing because of the fact that she was overprepared, because she was too essential in a way. In order for her to go to the school, her mom decides to just buy a house in the area in order to force her into the district to get into the school. And unfortunately, this house has to be next to the house that is the only different house in the entire town, which is the aviator's house. And that's how they got the house so cheap. I said house a lot, didn't I? And a little detail I noticed when they're driving to their new house is on the radio, he's actually reading from the original book, which I thought was a cool little detail. So in the next scene, we get a little bit more detail as to how depressing this girl's life truly is. And she doesn't even realize. By the way, just want to mention this. I don't think anyone has an actual name in this movie because that's kind of how the original story is. No one really has a name they're just labeled as someone so throughout the movie i'm just going to call them mom and little girl and the aviator but the mom who was voiced by rachel mcadams ended up creating an entire life plan for the little girl down to every second of her entire life even her birthday gifts are planned out everything in her life is planned out for her so she doesn't have to do anything and some people might consider her mom a terrible mother but i feel like this is a good representation of what some parents believe they need to do for their child. Some parents believe that doing all this stuff for their child, working their butt off, uh, just planning all this life out for their child is the right thing to do, when in reality, just spending time to get to know your child is way more important. Creating that bond is way more important than planning out your child's future. She even ends the scene with telling her daughter that she's going to make a wonderful grown up. So she's basically stripping her daughter of everything of her childhood and like speed running her to adulthood. We get introduced to the aviator and it was quite an awful introduction, I would say, as he almost kills the little girl by his plane blade flying into her house and destroying her life plan, which I just wanna mention is a really cool way to foreshadow what he's going to do. But the cops were called and he ends up giving them all of his life savings of pennies in order to pay for the damage, which is quite funny. So a bad start to their relationship, as it seems, the little girl is enjoying her life plan at the start because that's all she ever knew. She's following her life plan to a T and never deterring from it until once again, she was interrupted by the aviator. He ended up throwing a page through her window while she was studying and she starts to read this page and she sees the aviator and he just asks if she could use a friend and obviously she closes the window on him because you know he didn't really have a good introduction and when she was sorting all of the pennies into the little tubes she sorted through all of them and found some little toy dolls in there a sword a marble a seashell a plane and the little prince himself and so she ended up picking that story out of the trash and reading it and this is where we fall into the page and go into the stop motion paper mache world of the little prince the aviator lands in the desert and meets the little prince the prince asks him to draw a sheep. First one was too sickly, the second one was with horns, and the third one was too elderly. And his final one, he drew a box and said that the sheep is inside. And the reason this is so perfect is because the aviator cannot draw what the little prince wants, so he lets the little prince imagine the exact sheep that he wants inside of the box. It's almost like the little prince was testing his like creative mindset. It's such a cool way to describe imagination and perspective. Now the story piqued the little girl's curiosity, so she ended up going over to the old man's yard and I just want to say I kind of strive to be this old man when I'm older. Just his yard full of junk art and all this different stuff is just I, I, I kind of want to be that. So she starts asking him questions about the story in a more logical, analytical manner because that's how she was raised. Asking questions like, okay, why is there a boy in the middle of the desert? Like he probably wouldn't be able to survive. Where are his parents? So he invites her into his home in order to give her the next page of his story. And his home is filled with loads of collections or has he refers to them as hoarding. That's it, hoarding. 
That's what I am, a hoarder. And her response, once again, is very analytical as she sees all of this as a fire hazard. Again, she's viewing everything at face value, everything that's in front of her, everything that she could see, everything that she would view as essential. I, again, showing that contrast and characters that they are. The aviator tells her a little bit more of the story, and this is where the little prince meets his rose. His planet was very, very small and took a lot of effort to maintain. He had to constantly get rid of baobabs, which I guess are plants, if they grow too much, then they will destroy his entire planet. And one night, a sprout that he's never seen before came out of the ground and it turned into a rose. He instantly fell in love with this rose, but gradually her vanity started weighing. They both loved each other very much, but were too young to quite understand how to manage it and the work that goes into creating a bond and the patient. And so the little prince ended up leaving his planet. This story is cut off by the little girl's alarm to get back home. And when her mom arrives, she sees that she didn't really do any of her stuff. And the little girl told her that she met a friend and her mom kindly uh, put her friend on the board of her life and said that she could play with her friend next summer, only on Thursdays from 1 to 1.30. A little extreme, I would say. Instead of going to sleep, she reads more of the story and sees that the little prince is on his journey. He stumbles upon a king that lived on a very tiny planet. He claims that he rules all of the stars. However, he can only command them if conditions are favorable. He is a representation of what you would say power. And I would just like to say, I'm very happy I read the book because you really get a better sense of what these characters represent and uh, who they're supposed to be. Because in the movie, you really just get a small snippet of it. Because he talks as if he's a king, but his commands are quite reasonable to the point that they aren't even really commands. Almost as if he's convincing himself that he rules over the stars and rules over people. Like for example, when the little prince asks if he could give him a sunset, he says only when the conditions are favorable, around 740. That's when I will command the sunset to happen. Next, we have the conceited man who is addicted to admiration and applause. Someone who desires attention so much it's the only thing he craves. He wears a hat specifically for the reason to salute acclamation, which is obviously a representation of that very thing. So people who are obsessed with admiration and applause, having a bunch of followers, for example, when in reality, it, it doesn't really have any value. Next, we have the businessman who claims that he owns the stars and wants to make more money to buy more stars and count more stars. And in the book, he even talks about how he writes the number on a piece of paper with his name on it and saves it, which seems like such a ridiculous thing to claim that you own it just because it's on a piece of paper, but that is the real world. That is actually reality. But when you break it down to like a child's naivety and like the view of a child, it really seems kind of worthless and pointless. And they didn't add all of the characters from the book, which I kind of wish they added them because there's two more characters and they're honestly great. One is a drunkard that represents, you know, people who with alcoholism and, and addiction issues. And there's another one of a worker who all he does is light a candle and then put the candle out on order, which I believe to be the working class. So anyway, moving on, we get a little montage of the little girl aviator. They're hanging out, they're having fun, uh, bringing the fun back into the little girl's life, bringing that childhood to her and creating a bond. And this is parallel to the story that the aviator is telling at the same time about the little prince and a fox. The little prince runs into a fox and asks to play with them. And the fox replies with, no, I'm just another fox and you're just another human boy. However, if the little prince ends up taming him with patience in time and creates a bond with him, then that fox will be the only fox. It'll be his fox and vice versa. Again, the bond that is invisible is essential. And to further the sentiment, the little prince runs into a huge amount of roses and then he starts feeling sad because he realizes that his rose is just another common rose. But the fox tells him that it is not a common rose because it's his rose. You spent the time with the rose. You devoted all of that love to that rose. So it is your rose, it is special. And then the fox says the famous line that you can only see rightly with the heart and what is essential is invisible to the eye. We finally found out what the fox says. Okay, I'm sorry that I had, it, it, it was there. It, the joke was there. I couldn't not say it. It's not even a good joke. It, it was there. You know what I mean? I couldn't just... So the aviator tells the little girl that he's really happy that he finally found someone to listen to his story before it's too late. And this causes her to be like, yo, what do you mean too late? The aviator tells her that he's going to join the little prince soon. He's going to take off on his plane and go join the little prince, which 
You can take literally as a child watching this movie, or you could take it as an analogy for death, which actually is what it is. Now this makes the little girl quite upset. So he ends up taking her to get some pancakes. However, he's not really a good driver and he doesn't have a license. He ends up getting pulled over. And you know, an old man taking a girl in a car never really looks good, even with the kindest intent. So her mother finds out that the old man was actually the friend that she was talking about. He goes over and gives the aviator a talking to. And this is another good example of how this mom is trying to be a good mom in a bad way. Because she thinks that she's supposed to manage everything in her life and work all the time in order to make money for her to get the perfect education, you know, the perfect life. And her doing all this work, working herself to death is just neglect. In a way. And it shows really strongly here because she actually forgot her birthday, which is a little detail that I missed on my first watch. See, the aviator actually told her, hey, we can get some pancakes because they give free pancakes to people whose birthday it is. And then she says, well, it's not my birthday for two weeks. And he says, well, they don't know that. So her birthday isn't even for two more weeks, but her mom assumed it was today because she completely forgot. Again, I don't necessarily think her mom is bad. I think she just focuses on what she believes is essential, but in reality is not at all. At the end of the day, all it takes to be a good mom is just creating a good bond with your child, with any parent whatsoever. So we get a sad montage of her going back to a regimented life of, you know, every minute planned out, studying, working, organizing. And after this little girl got a taste of what creativity, childhood, imagination is, she's sad now. And we also kind of get a better idea of why her father isn't around as well, because her father every birthday sends her a snow globe of a city. And earlier she tells her mom that she is just like her father and soon she will disappear as well. So we're just assuming that her father worked so much that he just got lost in his work and just abandoned them because he was focused on things that he believed to be essential. So she eventually gets the rest of the story out of the trash, tapes it together. And then we see that the little prince and the aviator in the middle of the desert happen to find a well. And the little prince tells the aviator that the people here grow thousands and thousands of roses. However, they can't find what they're looking for. But maybe what they're looking for is just in a single rose or maybe a small drink of water. Honestly, I would say 99% of this book is quite quotable. So the little girl ends up making a decision. She wants to go with the aviator to see the little prince. However, the aviator tells her that he can't see her anymore. Assuming that, you know, her mother went over and probably threatened him. And then he tells the little girl that he has to go alone and he can't bring her with. And she's confused, so he ends up telling her the end of the story. The end of the story is quite sad, depending on which way you see it. The little prince makes a deal with the snake, asking him to send him home because the little prince is homesick, which requires this snake to bite him and kill him. And he ends up leaving the aviator with a gift. Among one of the stars in the sky, the little prince will be laughing. So whenever the aviator looks up at the sky, every one of the stars will be laughing. He tells him that the trip is too far and he can't carry his body with him. It is like he will be an abandoned shell and there's nothing sad about abandoned shells. So I think you could kind of figure out here that this is really just about death in a very different and honestly pleasant way to view death. And after the aviator finishes the story, she starts realizing what the aviator meant when he said that he has to go alone. He means that he's gonna die soon and he can't take her with. And the little girl's analytical brain starts taking over again, you know, telling him how can you know for sure that the little prince is out there? How do you know that he found his rose? How do you know that he's on a star and he's okay and he's laughing? And after realizing the truth of the situation, she gets angry and tells him that she hates the story and it's stupid and leave. And then one night when she comes home, she sees an ambulance at the old man's home. She takes a bike and rides it to the hospital and sees him wheeled away. And this is where her mom starts to realize how important this man truly is to her. So the little girl at night ends up sneaking out to get to the old man's plane in order to find the little prince. Now in the book, it just ends here. You know, the little prince gets bit by the snake. Uh, he passes and that's it. That's the end of the book. However, in this, they kind of make a closure to the said story. She ends up flying the plane to find the little prince and she notices there's no stars in the sky. And she finds an asteroid or planet that is covered in skyscrapers, very similar to what she gets from her father in the snow globe. And while she's flying, she sees what appears to be the little prince on the roof of one of these buildings. She ends up landing in the middle of the street and a cop shows up. And this cop just so happens to be that conceited man who is obsessed with attention. But how she was able to get away was getting everyone to clap for him. And you know, he had to tip it his hat, he couldn't help himself. He heads inside the building to find the little prince and she ends up running into the king, the one who commands the stars. And now he commands the elevator. And how she was able to get him to allow her to the top floor 
was asking him if the conditions are favorable and calling him majesty. And she finally meets the prince who is now all grown up and voiced by Paul Rudd. And he's not only grown up, but he also has forgotten everything about who he was as a child. He constantly worries about getting fired. He basically became a boring adult obsessed with numbers. And constantly this little girl is just trying to get him to remember who he is. But Mr. Prince ends up taking her to the academy teacher, the same one from the beginning of the movie who was uh, evaluating. And he ends up asking this teacher to help her. And his response is attempting to brainwash her because that's what happened to Mr. Prince. He wants to make her completely essential. As in his eyes, everything inessential must be made essential. Anything childlike must be made business. And it wasn't until Mr. Prince saw the box that was drawn by the aviator, the box that held the sheep, that he finally remembered who he was. So they escape and try to find her plane in order to get him to his rose and stumble upon all of the stars collected in what seems to be a snow globe, the same that her father gave her. That is kind of like a reoccurring thing throughout this movie is the snow globe. And all of these stars have been collected by none other than the businessman in order to make the stars essential. He uses the star's energy to boost productivity and his workers because he believes that stars in the sky set lazy men to idle dreaming. Classic old person take. And in the end, they were able to escape while at the same time letting all of the stars out of the snow globe and back into the sky. Flying back to his home planet, they pass by all of the other planets that he saw on his journey. They even do a little reference to the ones that we didn't see, the one of the drunkard and the one of the dude with the light pole. They head back to his home planet that is consumed by Baobabs. And when he finds his rose, his rose turns into dust. However, the little prince isn't sad, but this causes the little girl to break down saying that she doesn't want to lose the aviator. She doesn't want to grow old. She doesn't want to forget him because everything that she did here, saving the little prince, bringing him back to his rose was in hopes that in some way it would save the aviator. However, after she sees the little prince's rose in the sky and the little prince returns to his original form to tell her that his rose will never leave him. And that's when she realizes that the aviator will always be with her even after he leaves. He will just be that abandoned old shell. And again, there's nothing sad about an abandoned old shell. The movie ends with the little girl and her mom going to visit the old man in the hospital so she can give him a gift. She completed the story of the little prince and she gave it. It was kind of a last parting gift to him. And at the very end, we see the little girl and the mom go on their roof in order to look up at the stars in search of the aviator and the little prince because they will always be up there in the stars. God, this story just hits in so many different ways. So many deep, meaningful ideas and ways to view things in life. And it is definitely something that I personally needed right now. I don't really like to talk about a uh, personal stuff uh, on my videos, you know, I, I, I try to keep things light here. I try to keep things fun and enjoyable. But, uh, you know, this one really spoke to me in a different way. So if you enjoyed this video here, I hope that you subscribe and such. And always remember to hold on to your creativity and your childlike wonder. Don't let it fade. And I hope you guys have a good day.